You're watching KARK with Denise Whitaker and Bob Clawson. This is News 4 Arkansas at 6. Ten years ago tonight, Arkansans sat horrified as they watched the news and learned of the brutal killings of three boys at West Memphis. After disappearing the night before, police discovered their three bodies the afternoon of May 6, 1993. Now, on the 10th anniversary of the notorious West Memphis murders, News for Arkansas's Lindell Stout is here to examine what happened then, or at least what we know happened then, and also uh, why some actually believe that the killer is still out there. Okay, Bob and Denise. Well, of course, the West Memphis case is legendary. Mm -hmm. For some, it all ended when the accused were sent to prison. For others, that moment was just the beginning. The victims, Christopher Byers, Michael Moore, Stevie Branch, all eight years old, all neighbors in this West Memphis subdivision. They played together, disappeared together, died together. This was such a horrible crime. This is the creek where the bodies of the three little boys were discovered. To this day, the debate continues over whether they were actually murdered here or killed at another location and later brought here. No one debates the brutality. The boys found naked in the water, their hands and feet tied, their bodies beaten, cut, stabbed, one even castrated. The crime sent a panic through West Memphis. Who would ever do something like what was done to these three little boys. Police immediately began looking for the answer. We had, uh, I want to say, 14, 15 investigators working this case. Rumors spread through the religious community. Was it the work of the devil? Unfortunately, 10 years ago, it was widely believed and widely held by law enforcement uh, that cults were responsible for uh, basically all the missing children. Days turned into weeks, still no arrest. There was tremendous pressure on the police to get this wrapped up. Paranoia grew. There were some wild, wild rumors uh, floating around about what had happened, and a lot of it wasn't true. But the truth was bad enough. District Judge John Fogelman served as a Crittenden County Deputy Prosecutor at the time. One evening, while working on another case, a call from Inspector Mike Allen. They said, we've got them. We know who they are. After hours of questioning, Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., a borderline mentally retarded 17-year-old, had confessed. A confession, his father says, came after intense pressure from police. They cussed him. Pulled chair out of my room, spit in his face, stepped on his hand. At this point, he's saying he's thinking to himself, nothing I can say is going to deter these folks. And I didn't have anything to do with this, but they're not going to take no for an answer. Miss Kelly recanted the confession the next day, but had already implicated two other teens, 18-year-old Damian Eccles, who wore black and read books on witchcraft, and his friend, 16-year-old Jason Baldwin, who listened to heavy metal music. All three arrested, all three tried, all three convicted. Miss Kelly and Baldwin sentenced to life in prison without parole. Eccles, the death penalty. The case may have been forgotten had it not been for a pair of HBO documentary filmmakers. Tonight at 10, we'll take a look at how their movie grabbed the attention of the world and raised doubts about the guilt of the three teens who became known as the West Memphis Three. Baba Denise. All right, very interesting, Lindell. We'll see you tonight at 10. Okay, thanks. At 6 tonight, we re-examine the crime that shocked Arkansas and the nation. On May 6, 1993, West Memphis detectives discovered the bodies of three boys. And on the 10th anniversary of the notorious case, the three convicted killers remain in prison. But as News for Arkansas' Lindell Stout discovered, there are a lot of questions out there with this, Lindell, and, and a lot of folks are actually questioning, are the three who are in prison behind bars the killers. That's right, guys. Uh, a decade ago, three innocent lives were lost, but many people believe that this case is a double tragedy because of the three teenagers who were arrested and convicted. It may have all ended there had it not been for an HBO documentary.
With its gritty subject matter, Paradise Lost grabbed millions when it debuted on HBO in 1996. It was a very compelling documentary. Taking viewers right inside the courtroom for the dramatic murder trials of Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., Jason Baldwin, and Damian Eccles. Three teens accused of killing three little boys during a satanic ritual. Christopher Byers, Stevie Branch, and Michael Moore. But people sat stunned at the end of the film. It seemed to cast doubt, and it provoked questions. Was there enough evidence to convict the teens? How could Miss Kelly and Baldwin be sentenced to life in prison without parole? And Eccles given the death penalty. It shocked people, and then I think a lot of them expected that surely this will be corrected when this gets to the Arkansas State Supreme Court. The court upheld the convictions, but that didn't stop a group in California from taking action. They launched a campaign to free the West Memphis Three through a website, WM3.org, and demonstrations like this one at the Arkansas State Capitol. The group garners worldwide attention for their cause. They believe the three teens were persecuted for being different, wearing black, listening to heavy metal music, reading books on witchcraft. Little Rock author Mara Leverett agrees. They were pretty easy targets. Her new book, Devil's Knot, details the entire case beginning to end. An intricate filing system contains thousands of pages of court documents and case files. Because of this approach that I took, I was able to find things that I don't think anyone had ever seen before in the case. Leverett raises serious doubts about the West Memphis police investigation. There's a major discrepancy in what the stepfather of one of the murder victims told police in one interview. Leverett claims detectives didn't look closely enough at John Mark Byers, who had a history of violence and whose stepson Christopher was the only one of the three victims to be castrated. And she says investigators ignored another potential suspect, a man covered in blood who walked into a restaurant near the crime scene shortly after the boys disappeared. The owner of that restaurant had called the police, said, hey, you know, we, this guy's here. Do you want to come? And, and the police breezed by, didn't pay any much attention. Workers saved paper towels covered with blood and gave them to police. Asked about those at trial, they admitted that they had never been sent to the crime lab for examination because they had been lost. No one ever saw the man again. The defense was not allowed to mention the lost evidence at trial. Dan Stidham is the only original attorney still on the case. He represents Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. Mr. Miss Kelly never had a chance. Borderline mentally retarded, Miss Kelly confessed to the murders and implicated Baldwin and Eccles. Mr. Miss Kelly's plan was to tell them what they wanted to hear, then he could later change his story uh, and prove that, that uh, there was, he, he wasn't there, had nothing to do with it. The next day, Miss Kelly recanted the confession. Does Jesse t tell you that he regrets telling the police what he did that day? Oh, yeah. Critics say the confession is full of holes about the time of the murders and other important details. Still, for investigators, it became key evidence. When you look at circumstantial evidence, you have to look at each piece as it relates to the whole. No physical evidence exists that links Mr. Miss Kelly uh, or the other two to this crime. None. All managed to get on foot to three different homes and then clean up so perfectly that nobody notices this and, the, and not leave a footprint or a hair or a fingerprint at the scene and not carry a bit of mud or blood to, to, the, to any of their homes. If there was anything supernatural about this case that was it you get that in any type of high profile case uh, regardless uh, it's always the police botched a case up mike allen was the first detective to find one of the victims my personal opinion i think these three individuals are, are child killers but when asked about specific evidence in the case allen reveals little saying the convictions are on appeal and repeatedly brings up the hbo documentary if the justice system doesn't work, why not just send HBO film crew down here, let them do a documentary, run it on TV, have them call a 1-900 number, guilty or innocent. 
Now, our story doesn't end there. The murder case remains a touchy subject for some at the police department and throughout West Memphis. A little later in the show, we'll look at how people in the city are trying to move beyond the image of West Memphis, seen by millions in those HBO documentaries. And Bob and Denise will also take a, a look at the push to get DNA testing in this case. All right, very interesting. interesting. Coming up a little bit later. Okay, we'll see you then. Lendl, thanks. Now the conclusion of our special investigation into the West Memphis murder case. News for Arkansas's Lundell Stout's back with how this famous case really changed the town of West Memphis. Well, like everywhere in the heart of West Memphis, 10 years later, discussions continue on whether the West Memphis Three are guilty or innocent. One thing many of them can agree on, though, the notorious case forever changed the city. Still in the back of their head what happened, but they don't want to talk about it. Yet. West Memphis, Arkansas. Crossroads of two major interstates and part of a booming metro area. But still, a city stinging from what many believe was a negative portrayal in two HBO documentaries. As far as the hurt and the scar that that, that entire case had on this community, it's important that the community move on beyond that. And and the people are tired of it. But will the people involved ever be able to move on? If Damien had not gotten a death penalty, you and I would not be sitting here. The West Memphis Three get worldwide attention. Justice was not served, and there's a killer out there that, that nobody is looking for and uh, nobody seems to care about. They took my son away from me. For nothing. Something he didn't know. But police stand by their investigation and the conclusions of two different juries. They're grasping for straws. Uh, there, there was enough evidence to convict them. Still, many questions remain. That's why I wrote the book. One side is going to be right and, and the other is going to be wrong. Either there really was no evidence or there was plenty of evidence. And I concluded... There was not evidence. A decade later, had they lived, the three little boys would be 18 now. The three teens are now men in their late 20s, living their lives behind bars. The West Memphis Three continue to get lots of support. Musicians and others in the entertainment industry have stepped forward, raising money for the free the West Memphis Three Defense Fund. Money that's paying for more experienced attorneys and more than likely advanced DNA testing on certain pieces of evidence. And attorney Dan Stidham tells us he hopes that process can begin sometime in the fall. That certainly will shed some light, I guess, in one direction or another. But, and you spent a considerable amount of time on this. Books have been written about it, the HBO documentary. A lot of bases have to be covered here because there's so much to this story. There really is. And even though we spent a lot of time talking about it this evening, this is just the beginning. I mean, mm -hmm. there are so many elements to this story we can only begin to tell. All right, Lynn. Okay. Very interesting. Thanks Thank very you. much.